Okay, so, so let, let, let's continue. Um, so last time we talked about, uh, we gave a brief introduction to signals and systems. Um, so the, for the system part, the simplest, the simplest system, uh, it has an input and output. So the system can be regarded as a, a mapping that maps an input signal to a desired output signal. And we can combine different, different types of systems uh, together. For example, here the output can be further uh, set uh, into another system. And we have some examples for communication systems uh, as well as uh, artificial intelligence systems. So I want to share a very interesting system that we developed in a, in a course that I taught in the last semester. So this is a course for uh, advanced optimization uh, for machine learning. So what this, what this system does is a video surveillance um, system. Now, the input to the system is a streaming video. Uh, I don't have the input here, so I, I only have two outputs here. But you can imagine that the input is a streaming video that's taken by a, a surveillance camera. So you just place a camera there and the camera will record a video. So the, the, what the system does is that in order to do video surveillance, we want to separate the moving objects from the static backgrounds. After that, we can further, uh, once we have the moving objects, we can further uh, apply some detection algorithms to, to detect these moving objects. So the input is a, a, an arbitrary uh, video stream, uh, streaming video, and the output has two components. One is the static background part. Uh, the other is the moving objects part. So, so these are the outputs obtained by one of the students. So of course you need to implement that system by, by leveraging some uh, advanced algorithms. And the algorithms will process the input the streaming video and then create these two outputs. So basically the input is the composition, the superposition of these two outputs. And you can see that, uh, so now I'm playing the video for the uh, background part. So you can see this is a, basically a very static video. It, it just corresponds to a, the background of a cafe. Uh, we have some coffee machines there and this static floor. Uh, there are some shadows here that is due to the some artificial uh, imperfectness of the algorithm. And on the right hand side, uh, what this video shows is the extracted moving objects. You can we can see a lot of walking pedestrians. They are making coffees and moving around. And you can see that even their shadows uh, are extracted. So the challenge for this system is that, first of all, sometimes the, the, these working uh, people, they will block the background. Uh, if they are standing here, then you, will not be, you won't be able to see this desk anymore. But this algorithm can properly uh, re re reconstruct the background. So the background is very continuous and clean. 
And the other uh, challenge is that for the, this algorithm should be uh, applicable to any moving objects. So there's no, there should, there should not be any constraint on the uh, type of moving objects. So here you can see that it can apply to, uh, it can apply to any scenarios that, like these pe people are working randomly and they don't have a specific shape. So we can also apply this algorithm to, uh, to a video surveillance camera. For example, if the video uh, is about uh, the traffic, then the algorithm can extract the moving cars or vehicles. Yeah, so this is a very, very special example uh, about system. This is, again, uh, this is also an image uh, signal processing system because we are dealing with a discrete time uh, video, video signals. Yes. Yeah, it can be started when people are walking around. The uh, the intuition is that, uh, so maybe in some uh, at some point, uh, the the people will block part of the background, but then after a while, he will move away, so you can see the background again. Uh, but but the algorithm will utilize uh, that part to reconstruct the previous part, the missing part of the background. Okay, so so starting from this lecture, we we are going to uh, first of all give a review lecture on complex numbers. Now, this is the we need two two mathematical backgrounds for this course. One is complex numbers; it's everywhere. The other is uh, no, calculus. Um, so before going into this part, I want to ask a, a general question. How many of you are very familiar with uh, these complex numbers and all these uh, properties? Okay. So how about the students over the Zoom? Are you, are you familiar with this, the concept of complex numbers? You can type your answer uh, in the chat box. Okay. Yeah, I guess I will still go over all the details and the properties that we need in case that you miss something. Um, so a complex number is the extension of real num the real number system. Okay, uh, very specifically, every complex number is, can be characterized by a pair of real numbers. So let, let's say here Z, the complex number, and we, there are many ways to write it. Uh, one of them is to write out these uh, real and imaginary components. X and Y are two real numbers. So in the standard form, we write complex Z as uh, X plus J Y. Okay, so here Z is a complex number. It belongs to the complex domain. And X X is a real number and we call it the real part of this complex number. And Y is also a real number and we call it the imaginary part.
Okay, so these are uh, um, very standard. But what's important is that both of them are real numbers. But X is alone, where Y is multiplied by a notation J. Uh, what is J here? J is the complex unit that uh, is defined as the square root of negative one. But apparently, this is not a real number because you cannot find any real numbers whose square root corresponds to a negative one. At so we, we, we specially introduce this unit in the complex number system. So the way we play with this J is that um, it satisfies J square equals to negative one by, by the definition, because it's the square root of negative one. So taking square, we got negative one. So to summarize, uh, once we introduce this complex unit J, then we can uh, we can express any complex number in this standard form. It has so J is already defined here. So then, for any complex number, we just need to know its real part and imaginary part. So this X and Y are two real numbers that index this unique complex number. And uh, in throughout the course, we will we will use R E to represent the re, uh, the real part of a complex number Z. So R E uh, corresponds to real, the first two letters for real. R E Z is the real part of the complex number. So in this case, so we can see it's a real part. So R E the real part of this complex number is just X. And similarly, we use uh, IM stands for the imaginary part. So the imaginary part of this complex number Z is the real number Y. Yeah, just to emphasize here that the both of these two real part imaginary part, they are real numbers. Okay. In particular, this imaginary part does not include this J. Okay. It only corresponds to the real number Y. Okay. So what, what we just talked about is a so-called Cartesian form of a complex number. Well, it is written, it is expressed as the real part plus J times the imaginary part. And uh, if you take some digital communication courses in the future, we also call X and Y, the real part as the in phase component, the imaginary part also is also called as the quadrature components. But in this course, we, we, we use real and imaginary to use these notations. Okay, so since uh, every complex number is associated with two real numbers, the real part and the imaginary part, so we can draw, we can visualize this complex number in a 2D plane. So we can, like in this figure, in the, in the bottom left figure, we have two axes. One is the real, uh, one is the axis for the real part. One, the Y axis is for the imaginary part. So given any complex number, uh, C equals to X plus JY, uh, it corresponds to a single point in this 2D plan. Basically, the, the location of this point so the X, the value of X, we can find uh, X on the real axis and find the point Y in the imaginary axis. And then their intersection will give us the 
corresponding complex number. Okay, so this is the way one way to visualize the complex number as by uh, by using the Cartesian fold. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. Um, the other, the other very important, equally important uh, form is called the polar form. So we can also express complex numbers uh, in the polar form. And the idea is very simple. So if you want to index a point in a 2D plane, you can either index the X uh, through these two X and Y axes. Is this is the called the Cartesian system. The other way that you the other way that you can do is to uh, index this point through this polar system. Well, you just need to know this angle between uh, this arrow and the x axis, and and also you need to know the distance between this point to the original point. Okay. So these two are, are equivalent ways to index a single point. In a 2D plane. So the second way uh, will give us the polar form of this complex number. So we write uh, Z complex number. We can also uh, it can also index by the distance to the original point. We call this R multiplied by E to the power of J times theta. Okay. So to visualize this, So in particular, this uh, we call this R the magnitude of this complex number. So we always okay we call this R the magnitude of this complex number V. So this operation, so this operation stands for absolute value for real numbers, right? We know this. Absolute value of a real number. So for complex numbers, it stands for the magnitude. So this this part uh, must be non non zero, uh, non negative. Sorry, must be non negative because it corresponds to the magnitude. Uh, the, the other part is the theta, which index this angle. Uh, the range for theta could be the standard range zero to two, two, two pi. Okay, so basically, uh, if you have a complex number, basically, if you have a fixed point in this complex plane, then we, we can calculate this distance, calculate this angle. Once you have these two, you can express this complex number in this uh, polar form. Of course, uh, one thing is less clear is to compare this to the Cartesian form. Everything here is, is very well defined. X and Y are two real numbers uh, corresponding to the X and Y coordinates. J is J defined as this complex series. So these three elements, they are clear to us. However, for the polar form, uh, once we know uh, this R, once we know this theta, uh, what is less clear 
is how do we understand this exponent e to the power of j theta. Uh, the in particular t of j is the complex unit. So in the next slide, we will explain this part. So to summarize, to summarize any complex number, we have two systems to describe it. One is the Cartesian system, which is indexed by the coordinates. And one is the polar system indexed by the magnitude and phase. So we call theta the phase component of this complex number. All right. So here we are. We have these two equivalent uh, systems to uh, express this complex number. So one question is: even one, even this complex number in one form, how do we translate this into into the other form? So these are the translate uh, relationship, the relationship between these two systems. Uh, for example, okay, let's look at this part first. Even a polar form. So given this R and theta, uh, we want to we want to go to a Cartesian form. Given a uh, complex number in the polar form, how can we get this Cartesian form? So this can be derived directly from this uh, figure. So given this theta and R, now we are we can uniquely identify a complex point. This, this is the complex number that we are looking at. And now we want to we want to know the Cartesian form of this complex number. Therefore, we are looking at its x and y coordinates. So this is x, this is y. And from this figure, we can tell that x, uh, which is this uh, horizontal set line segment, x equals to r cosine theta. And similarly, y equals to r sine theta. So therefore, once we know r and theta, we can get x and y in this, uh, in this form. Uh, and the second uh, second part is the other way around. So given a Cartesian form, how do we get to the polar form? Again, it's by looking at this figure. By looking at this figure here. Now we are we are given the x, this line segment uh, x, and this vertical segment y. So we can definitely compute this uh, line segment R. As we have 90 degrees here, so it's x squared plus y squared taking square root. But given the x coordinate, y coordinate, we can get this distance R. And theta is a little bit tricky. So the theta is now we have x here, we have y here. So tangent theta is y over x. So theta is tangent inverse y over x. 
So tangent image is, is basically our tangent. However, however, we need uh, we need to add some. We need to add, add some extra components to handle the case if x if the real part is negative. So. So this is the full expression for theta. If the real part is positive, meaning that if the complex number that we are looking at is on the right half plane, is on the right half plane of this uh, space, then we can just look, uh, compute the arc tangent of y over x. Otherwise, if x, if the, this complex number is on the left hand side of this uh, uh, plan then of this of the y axis then we need to add an extra pi to this theta this is because the the function this arctangent function can only give you um, an angle between negative two pi negative pi over two to pi over two so you you need to add this that's extra pi so that we can we can cover the entire uh, range of all the angles But anyway, so following this, following these two formulas, once we, once we are given the Cartesian coordinates x and y, we can calculate r and theta. Okay. So any questions? Right. So. Um, Okay, I, I can I can just consider let's let's consider two examples. Um, yeah, if the point that we are looking at is on the right hand right hand side of the of this y axis, we can just use theta right. This theta is just the uh, This is because uh, the arc tangent function it uh, it automatically covers net uh, the range the negative pi over two to pi over two. So negative pi over two. So where's negative pi over two? Is here, right? Negative pi over two to pi over two. So it covers the right hand side of the y axis. So that's why in this case we don't have to do any correction. However, if the point that we are looking at is uh, is here, is here, then we have this uh, y and uh, x. So now what happens is that. What happens is that if we just do this, if we just calculate this, it actually gives us um, it actually gives us this this alpha. Right. So we have to so this this is alpha. So we have to add a pi. So alpha adding a um, right. Alpha adding pi, where then we can go to uh, this line. Right. This alpha is a negative. The angle is negative. Negative, uh, negative adding this pi, we will get this this angle here. Yeah. Well, this is theta. Yeah. But it's a, a little bit difficult. But you can just follow this, follow this uh, rules. Okay. 
these two can be you know, com compactly summarized uh, by using the indicator function. Right? <coughs> indicator, if the x less than zero is true, we add a pi. Uh, this is indicate binary indicator function. If this condition holds, this indicator function gives one. Otherwise, it gives zero. But anyway, it can be these two are equivalent. Okay, so these are the relation between these two systems. And then we need to do a lot of uh, calculations regarding complex numbers. Obviously, for real numbers, we do addition, multiplication, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Everything is the same here for complex numbers. So uh, addition for complex numbers is very straightforward. Once we are, if we want to add two complex numbers, we write out their standard Cartesian form. So C1 is X1 plus JY1, C2, X2 plus JY2. And we just combine the real parts and the imaginary parts together, respectively. So we, you can see that it is very convenient to do addition by by using the Cartesian form because they are uh, the Cartesian form is already in a in a standard addition form. So it's very convenient to add different parts together. And the polar form is more convenient when we do multiplication or division of complex numbers. So for example, here we have this, uh, if we want to calculate Z1 times Z2, so what do we do? We use the polar form here, right hand side. So Z1 by the polar form is R1 e to the power of j theta 1, the standard polar form, times, times R2 E J theta 2. And since everything is in a multiplication, so we can just combine the. So R1 and R2, we can put them together. And for these expo exponentials, we can also combine them together by using the rule of exponential. Okay, this is theta 1 plus theta 2 in the exponent. Right. So you can see it's very convenient to do multiplication in the polar form. Just multiply the magnitudes and sum up the phase, phase components. <laughs> and again, if you want to do Z1 over Z2, it's the same. So you, you have R1 over R2 and these two exponentials by the exponential rule, you have theta one minus theta two now. Okay, so that's the bottom part. And as a comparison, if you if you want to do this multiplication in the using the Cartesian form, then you have to, then it's a little bit, little bit more complicated. You have Z1 times Z2. Now you're writing out their Cartesian form. Okay, you have these two. So this Z1, this is Z2. Now this is their Cartesian form, which is the addition of two components. So you need to use the this you need to distribute them. So we have x1, x2 is right here. And then this j times x1, y2, that's the second part. And here is j, x2, y1. And the last one is j square, y1, y2, right? 
And then you can, you can still simplify that because J is special. You have a J square here. So J square is negative one. It's a complex unit. And then the last term can be combined with the first term. So you have X one, X two, minus Y one, Y two. These two terms can be combined together plus J times X one, Y two plus X two, Y one. So that's what that's how we get the, this product in the Cartesian form. And you can see that this is again this is a standard Cartesian form because it is a real number x1 x2 minus y1 y2 a number real number plus complex unit times another real number right so therefore you can say that you can say that the real part of z1 times c2 is is this one and the imaginary part Is, is this part. Right? And we can do more things. We can verify. We can verify this. We can verify the magnitude expression. So, okay, we, we know we know the real part and the imaginary part we can calculate is magnitude, but we can just treat the real part of this complex number is this, imaginary part of this complex number is this. So we can get this magnitude. So the magnitudes of Z1 times C2, okay, by using this, by using this magnitude formula, we have the real part, we have the imaginary part, we can calculate this magnitude. So let's do that. Is square root of real part square plus imaginary part square. Okay. And uh, on the other side, on the other side, okay. Okay, let, let's just go. Let's just do these calculations and see what we get. Okay, before, okay, let, let me just convince myself first. Before we do the calculations, from the polar form, we know that. Um, well, going back to the polar form, it's right here, right? <clears throat> going back to the polar form, we know that Z1 times Z2 uh, equals to this, this one. This is a standard polar form. And the magnitude of this complex number is R1 times R2, right? The phase is theta1 plus theta2. So if you want to look at the magnitude of this complex number, it is just R1 times R2. It is just R1 times R2. Okay, keep going. What is R1? What is the what is R1? R1 is the magnitude of Z1, right? R1 is the magnitude of the first complex number. How do we express the magnitude of Z1 in terms of its Cartesian coordinates? Yes. Yes, it's again using this uh, using this formula. So it's the square root of x1 plus y1, no, uh, yes, this one. Is this one, 
right? And similarly, you have the uh, root of R X2 plus Y2. Okay, so you have this uh, two different expressions. They must be equal. They must be equal. You can check that. This is correct. Y is when you expand these two quadratic terms, you have all those x1, x2, y1, y2 squares. And you can find the cross terms will cancel out. While here, the cross term is negative 2 x1, x2, y1, y2. There is positive 2 x1, x2, y1, y2. They cancel out. So you only have four square terms. And you, if you look at the bottom side, when you when you expand this out, is okay. again you will have four square terms. Right. So this is this is what you get by distributing these two products. And on this one, you get the same result. They are they are equal. They are equal. Right. So the cross terms will cancel out. So everything left is the product to the power of two terms. You have four of them. So therefore, we, we verify that this, these two systems, uh, this formula is very consistent. So there's nothing wrong here. Is it clear? Yeah. So this is how you, when you play with complex numbers, you, you have to do a lot of uh, messy calculations. Okay, so So we can we can go over one example. I can generate a random example. Okay, this is a complex number. Find, uh, express this complex number in the standard polar form. Okay, let's do both. What is the Cartesian form and what is the polar form? Write, write down their uh, standard Cartesian form and polar form. I can give you three to five minutes.
Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, anyone get the answer for the addition for? So it's a one plus two J, right? Two times J. Okay. So uh, how did you get this answer? So how did you calculate J to the power of five? Yeah. So you have j squared negative one. Uh, yeah, j squared negative one. J to the fourth. But j to the fourth is, uh, is j to the power of two to the power of two. Right. Yeah, so this is one instead. Right. This is the copy of the measure. Two plus two is four. So this this would be negative one to the power of two is one. So j to the fourth is one. So j to the fifth is this one times another j. So you got you got j. J to the fifth is j. So that's so you get one plus j instead of uh, two j. Yeah. So be careful when you calculate the exponentials of this j. It's a little bit tricky. You have j to the power two is negative one. So you have you, know, you can do this. Fix j to the power three is negative j. So you have this uh, Cartesian form, and now you have. Um, so one quick question, what is the imaginary part of this partition form? Yeah, it's just one, right? So J times one. And now you have the real part, you have the imaginary part. So the polar form, so X, the real part equals to one, imaginary part equals to one. And you have the polar form by looking at this this formula. So R should be square root of one plus one, which is square root of two and theta is, now X is greater than zero. So we can denote that time. So we just do half tangent y over x, which is one. And this is uh, pi over four. This is a very special angle. 45 degrees tangent equals to one. Okay. So this, this is the uh, addition and the multiplication. Uh, we, we will do more practice in the in the homework, and the last one is also a very very important and very special to complex number only. It's the conjugation operation. It is as important as the other two operations. So conjugate. So given a complex number z, okay, we have the, we have the two two forms, Cartesian form, polar form, write them out. We define the, we define a conjugate, uh, the conjugate of this complex number as Z star. This is the notation, Z star is the conjugate. Now, what, what is this? It is basically we, uh, changing the imaginary part changing the sign of the imaginary part. Instead of having a plus y here, we have minus y. Okay. And similarly, in the polar form, it is equal, equal to 
reversing the sign of the base. Okay, so instead of a theta, we have negative theta here. Negative theta. So you can visualize if this is Z, you can see that only thing that we do is to change, uh, changing the sign of the imaginary part. So Z star would be right here. So Z and Z star, they are symmetric with regard to the uh, real axis. You can see that for the Z, Z for the conjugate, the, the angle is re, uh, reflected and, and, and therefore the corresponding imaginary part is also reflected. So this is why this is negative one. So this is a conjugation. We only put a negative sign to the imaginary part and the face part. Now, why is why is conju conjugation so important? Because it is, it is very very convenient uh, for us to do multiplication or or other complex calculations uh, using conjugation. For example, if we want to calculate if you want to calculate the, the magnitude of a real number. Oh, sorry. If you want to calculate the magnitude of a complex number Z, uh, we know it is the square root of X square plus Y square for the Cartesian form. We know it is, it is the, uh, the R. So I write it in this way. We know it is the R in the polar form. However, this can be very uh, conveniently written as Z times Z conjugate. Uh, this is a very important uh, equation that we are going to use a lot of times. So the magnitude to the power of two equals to Z times Z conjugate. Okay, we can show this. Now, Z times, we just need to write out this Z times Z conjugate and then see what we get. We can use different, uh, different forms. First, we try the polar form. Z is R e to the power J theta. Now, Z conjugate by the definition of conjugation, we only keep, we only revert the sign of the face part. Okay. So now you can multiply them together. You can see the, these two exponentials cancel out. So you have R squared. But R squared, R is the magnitude already. So R squared is the magnitude to the power of two. So this proves this equation. And you can see that uh, the way that this conjugate does is to basically cancel out the phase part. So we are synchronizing the phase of the signal to zero. Once we, we have no phase component, all that left is the magnitude component. Now using the Cartesian form, you can also get this uh, result. Okay. Again, by definition, we only revert the sign of the imaginary part. And then you just write out, we have X square. Uh, well, the cross, oh, okay. Let, let's do one by one. X square minus J X Y cross J X Y minus J square X Y.
And definitely these two cancels out. So what we have is x squared. We have minus j squared x y. J squared is very special, nephew y. Now j squared is nephew one minus j squared plus plus one. So we okay, actually, yeah. So that's a mistake. Should be y squared. Okay, it's y it's nephew j squared y squared. Nephew j squared very special. It's just one. So you have x squared plus y squared. That's what you get. So x squared plus y squared is exactly the square of this magnitude by this definition. Okay, so you can see that by multiplying a complex number by its own weight, you get a real number, which is the magnitude to power two. You know, magnitude is magnitude of complex number is a real, real number. To the power of two is a real number. So if, if Z is a real number, okay, if Z is a real number, well, complex numbers covers real numbers, right? If this complex number is real, meaning that it does not have uh, imaginary component, so meaning that Y equals to zero, Y equals to zero. In this case, we can see that Z equals to Z conjugate because this Y, these two Y's, now they, they, they vanish. So Z is X, Z is a real number X, the conjugate is again the real number X. They are equal, so, so in this case, multiplying uh, by its conjugate is basically, it's basically Z squared. Now we can write z squared because z is now a real number. Real number we know is uh, we can define the square of the real number. But for complex numbers, we always uh, before we take in squares, we always uh, calculate this magnitude. So, okay. Now, for example, how, how, how can we use complex uh, con conjugation to calculate the com to simplify complex numbers? So for example, we, we want to find out the Cartesian form of this complex number. And this complex number is given by the division of two complex numbers, one plus j divided by one minus j. Now, what is the Cartesian form? So do you have any ideas how to do this? Now we have a division of two complex numbers, but the Cartesian form does not have any division. Right? Cartesian form is x plus j y. Well, x and y are real numbers, and you have a j here, but you never have a j in a, in a denominator. So if you look at the Cartesian form, the denominator is actually one. X plus J1 divided by one. So somehow that we need to get rid of this J in the denominator. And uh, that is how conjugation is very useful here. And this is how you simplify all these types of 
uh, division structures, complex numbers in, involved in these division structures in a standard Cartesian form. You basically multiply the numerator and the denominator by a same number, which is the conjugate, conjugate of the denominator. Okay. Uh, just multiply uh, both both sides by the conjugation of the denominator. Now the denominator is one minus three, so its conjugation uh, its conjugation is one plus three. Right. The conjugation only reverses the sign of the imaginary part. Now you can check that because because the if you look at the denominator is is the this complex number multiplied by its conjugate, right? And from this formula, we know that any complex number multiplied by its conjugate is the magnitude to the power of two. So that's the, that is definitely a real number. So that's how that's that's this is how we get rid of the complex numbers in the Denominator multiplied by its conjugate, we get we can verify that this is the magnitude. Okay, first of all, the numerator now becomes one plus j is 12. The denominator you can verify is the magnitude of this one to the power of two. But by, by utilizing this equation. Okay, and then we can further uh, simplify this. For the for the denominator, uh, the magnitude of one minus three. This is a standard. Uh, this is a standard Cartesian form. So we can very easily calculate this magnitude to one plus one. Right, because the the real part is one, imaginary part is negative one. So you have this uh, by utilizing the this magnitude formula, you have square root of one square plus negative one square. Okay, so it's the magnitude to the power of two. The numerator you have one plus j square, so you can write them out as one plus j square plus two j. Now you can see the, the denominator is a real number. You get, get rid of the complex number here. Okay, keep simplifying, keep simplifying. J square is negative one. And negative one cancels with positive one. So you have two J in the numerator. And the, the denominator is square root of two to the power of two, which is two. Okay, so you finally get J. So this is the standard Cartesian form. It has no real part. The, the imaginary part is one. Okay, so remember, whenever you see a fraction complex number that has a whose denominator is complex, you can always simplify this uh, into a standard form by multiplying both sides by the conjugate of the denominator. Okay. Because by multiplying the denominator with its conjugate, uh, you can make you can guarantee that this will the denominator will become a real number. So by multiplying the complex number by its conjugate, you always get a real number. So you can get rid of the complex in the denominator.
So any questions about uh, this congregation? Okay, well, there's a lot of formulas today. Uh, but we will, we will go over this again and again throughout the semester. <clears throat> so the Euler's formula uh, talks about this special uh, exponential, it's e to the power of j times theta. So uh, Euler's formula shows that this is specifically uh, complex number and it can be specifically written as cosine theta plus j times sine theta. So this is the Euler's formula. Therefore, once we have a theta, even any theta, we can calculate. We know what is e to the power j theta. It is a complex number whose real part is cosine theta. And the imaginary part is sine theta. A, a very useful and fundamental formula. For example, we can try e j uh, two pi. We will see this a lot. E j two pi is plug in into the Euler's formula cosine two pi plus j sine two pi. Okay, now sine two pi, two pi is a period of sine function. So sine two pi equals to sine zero. So this, this is zero and this is one. So you, you just get one. You can also try e j pi. No. Sine pi is again is zero. Uh, sine pi is here. Pi is here. Sine of pi is zero. So cosine pi is negative one. Because it's, it's in the negative side. So this is negative one. Right. So you can you can just plug in different theta. And following the uh, Following the, this Euler's formula, we can also have the uh, inverse Euler's formula. So cosine theta can be expressed in, in this form. It's these two exponentials divided by two. If e j theta plus is conjugate, right? This you can see that this is can be interpreted as is conjugate because only the base part is the sign of the base part is inverted. So, so this is cosine theta. Now sine theta is the, the, the difference divided by 2j, divided by 2j. So how do, we, how do we prove this? This is very easy to prove. We just need to have these two. This is the original Euler's formula. Now I'm following this Euler's formula, but instead, I plug in negative theta instead of theta. Now again, by following this Euler's formula, theta now becomes negative theta. So I have cosine negative theta plus j sine negative theta. But we know that cosine is an even function. So cosine negative something equals to cosine itself. So cosine negative theta is cosine theta. But sine is an odd function. So we have uh, sine negative theta as negative sine theta. Okay. Now you can see that you have two equations and uh, you can treat cosine and sine as two 
variables. There are two equations, two variables we can solve for sine and theta and cosine theta in terms of the other components. So that's how you, once you solve these two equations, you can get these two formulas. Okay. Uh, especially for the sine theta, uh, the denominator has an extra J. So be careful when you use this one. And uh, this can explain a lot of things that we introduced in the previous slide. For example, we can, once we have the polar form, once we have the standard polar form, plug in the Euler formula. So replace EJ theta by, by the Euler formula, we end up with a standard Cartesian form. And you can see that the real part is R times cosine theta. The imaginary part is R times sine theta. This is exactly the formula that we introduced in the previous slides. The real part is the magnitude times cosine theta. The imaginary part is magnitude times sine theta. So this can be derived by the Euler's formula here. And the other thing is that looking at the, so since e j e to the power of j theta is a complex number, we can look at this magnitude. Always look, we can always look at the magnitude of complex number. So because e j theta is takes this standard Cartesian form. So following the formula for the magnitude, the magnitude of this complex number is the square root of real part square plus imaginary part square. And we know that all cosine and sine functions, this sum up to one. So that is to say the magnitude of this complex number is one. And that is, that is actually very straightforward because this complex number is already in a standard polar form, right? It is, it is exactly one multiplied by e to the power of e j theta. So one is the magnitude, but we can verify that by the Euler formula. Okay. <clears throat> and we can also look at complex exponentials. Well, uh, it's basically e to the power of z. It's e to the power of z. Now this z is an arbitrary complex number. So, okay, since z is a complex number, we know that it, ha it can be written in a standard Cartesian form. So we can plug in this Cartesian form. So it's e to the power of x plus jy. Now by the property of the exponential, we can write this as e to the power of x times e to the power of jy. Okay, and now what is the reason that we want to do this is because e to the power of x is a real number because this, this uh, e is a numerical number and to the power of x, x is the real part of the complex number, so it's real. So in general, this is real. And for the other part, e to the power of jy, we can just follow the Euler's formula. Here we have e to the power of j theta equals to this one. So for the for this part, by using the Euler's formula, we get this. We get this. And then you can you can conclude that the real part of this complex number is e to the power of x times cosine y. The imaginary part is e to the power of x times sine y. Okay, so Euler's formula is used to deal with these complex exponentials.
or it provides at the same time, we can sort of say it provides a link between exponential form, polar form, and Cartesian form. And the left hand side is a polar form. Of course, this is the proof that I was given. Uh, this is the proof. Um, yeah. You can take a look. Okay, the, so the last slide is uh, some some uh, applications of the formula. So we know from the from the previous slides, cosine C that can be rewritten as the average of these two complex exponentials. Right, we have shown it here. We have shown it here. At the same time, because cosine theta is here, right, in the Euler's formula, cosine theta uh, takes the role of uh, the real part. So we can say, we can also say that. Okay, for this cosine theta is basically the real part of the complex number of this complex number, right? Because this complex number has this standard Cartesian form whose real part is just cosine theta. So this is a very uh, convenient way to, to express cosine theta. Uh, you will see this a lot in particular if you take the communication courses. So these two are equivalent, equivalent expressions for cosine theta. So we can express, uh, so basically if we look at this cosine signal, a cosine wave, we can, we can basically uh, using the first formula to equivalent, equivalently written it as in terms of the complex exponential signals. Okay, and also by using the second formula, we can also express a cosine wave as the real part of this complex exponential signal. Okay, so uh, I think I will stop here and uh, please review these slides multiple times until you, you are familiar with all the shapes of complex numbers. And you can start start it working on form of one. There are several problems on the complex numbers. So if you have any questions, just come to my office talk to me. <laughs>